In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we are told in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. So then, we confess our sins. O most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. But for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, please have mercy upon us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all of our sins. To those who believe in Jesus, he gives the power to become the children of God, and he bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we reflect John 1.12 and Philippians 1.6. This is the last Sunday of the church year, and the lessons are uh, great. We're going to concentrate especially on the gospel lesson from Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. Jesus said, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him he will gather all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. When the king will say to those on his right, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or and feed you, or thirsty, and give you drink? When do we see you a stranger, or welcome you, or naked, and clothe you? And when did we see you sick, or in prison, and visit you? And the king will answer, Truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then I will also, they will also answer, Lord, when do we see you hungry, or thirsty, or stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? And he will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of these, the least of these, you did not do it to me. These then will go into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Well, this is the gospel of the Lord. This uh, text is a great text and is uh, generally well known. Uh, It is... Uh, at the very end, as it's recorded in Matthew, of Jesus' Olivet Discourse. And uh, it's at this point we find uh, that uh, Jesus then is uh, concluding his uh, time of public instruction to the uh, apostles and his moments with them and is going to be betrayed and uh, taken off to uh, fulfill what the prophecies of the scripture uh, have told us to be the way that God had already predetermined to be the way that the sins of the world would be paid for 
by the uh, atonement of our Lord Jesus Christ and his payment for our sins on our behalf. It's a rich text, and it does describe a glorious moment, the end of the world. Uh, in recent days, we've uh, thought about uh, some of the passages that deal with the, um, the horrible aspect of the end of the world. Uh, there, there's going to be a lot of uh, cosmic upheaval. There'll be things that will be there that are going to be scary in their own way for all. And uh, it will be something that comes suddenly. But now, now we focus on the final judgment. And Jesus begins to inaugurate in full the glory of the everlasting kingdoms. The everlasting kingdom that he will have in heaven. And well, what is there as the uh, opposite for those that... Uh, never really wanted to humble themselves before Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And so um, they'll go into the outer darkness. They'll go where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. They'll go when there's a, where there is an e eternal um, longing for something and uh, an eternal longing for some kind of hope, but there will be none. Well, we find that Jesus comes, and indeed he, he separates. There is no middle ground. There's not some people that are, well, they're still in process. Either you are one that belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ and that you have put your faith and trust in him, or you're not. And so there is a separation into two distinct groups. The sheep and the goats, the people on the right, the people on the left. Uh, we have is a description of uh, where Jesus indeed uh, again, well, calls things for what they are. And people either believe in him and trust in him, or they do not. Either they submit to him as their Lord, or they do not. There is no middle ground. What do we find? We find that a explanation is given to this I owe uh, uh, debt of gratitude to uh, a fellow I went to seminary with named Jeff Gibbs who wrote the uh, Concordia commentary on the uh, book of Matthew. Uh, he uh, points out that Jesus talks about this in regard to his brothers. While indeed we are told that we're to love our neighbor as ourself. Here specifically, in this judgment scene, we're not talking about neighbors, we're talking about brothers. Um, this is important that uh, we see that the one does not negate the other, but having uh, said that, the focus here is more of one of missionary encouragement than it is of just a uh, plan to uh, have us be about a more general social ministry. To be sure, it's good to try to help all the people that are in need, who are hungry or who need uh, clothing. But especially, uh, we're to be part of the family. Uh, we're to pray for all people and to be helpful to all people, but especially the family of God. So we find that uh, here Jesus, he identifies with those who bear his name. This is uh, similar to what we find in the book of Acts when uh, we have Jesus make an appearance to St. Paul on the road to Damascus. And he says to him, Paul, Paul, or at that point, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Well, Jesus so identifies with the body of Christ, the church, and he takes very personal the fact that Paul went out to persecute the church, and in so doing, he was persecuting him. Oh. So here we find that Jesus identifies with those that are his own, that are at times where they're hungry. Well, 
they should be able to look to the rest of the family to feed them. We don't have our children uh, decide to have to work uh, to find their own food and have their own food prepared, especially when they're in their youngest stage. Uh, there are other times that we find that there are other people on the other end of the spectrum. There are times where some of our older people that are blessed by God to attain to a great age, well, they're no longer capable of really taking care of themselves. And so there are different times when people are in special need and we're to be sensitive to that. Especially we want to be sensitive again to the missionary enterprise that we are about. There are many interesting things here and there are people that have tried to use this in a way to support very worthwhile ministries, but maybe their exegesis uh, or their study of the scripture needs a little bit of help. Uh, I know Chuck Colson I tried to make a lot about the prison ministry and all I was in prison and needed to be visited. We do find that the prison that we have described in biblical times was usually a place where more political prisoners were put, something like we think of with Nelson Mandela in our own era, if you will. We find that uh, John the Baptizer was put in prison. Why? Because he was on the wrong side of a political thing. When Joseph in the Old Testament was put in prison, well, uh, we find that uh, most assuredly Potiphar, who was in the spot to put him in prison, he had every reason to know that Joseph was most likely innocent and he needed to deal in such a way without trying to um, publicly come out and say, my, uh, my wife is an uh, is, uh, ignoble woman. She's a, she's a uh, let's say, uh, terribly unfaithful and she's uh, not uh, somebody that's a, a worthy woman at all. No, he had to do something. And so poor Joseph, even though uh, Potiphar almost assuredly knew that he was innocent, had to sadly choose much the same way that we see that Pilate did in the New Testament, where he knew that Jesus was not guilty of the crimes that he was put before him to think, but he, he finally gave in to the crowd because, well, to not give in to the crowd set him up possibly to be removed from office by his upper authorities. And so rather than do what the honorable thing that he should have done, well, he looked out for number one. Well, what do we find? We find then that Jesus commends this. I had an elder at one time in my church that struggled with this uh, ending to this uh, thing where it says that those that uh, do, uh, th those that have done these good things, well, what are they gonna have? They're going to go into heaven. Those that didn't, they're gonna go into eternal punishment. It's the same way that the Athanasian Creed ends. One of the great creeds, the, one of the great ecumenical creeds of the church. Before the church uh, split and, and went their various ways, we find that there was real consensus on the Apostles' Creed. There was real consensus on the Nicene Creed. There was real consensus on the Athanasian Creed, which by the way, was almost surely not written by Athanasius, who, uh, wrote in Greek, the Athanasian Creed, it is in Latin, reflects a later time in the church, but it certainly reflects the theology of Athanasius and all those that are truly uh, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. That creed ends in this way, talking about the Lord Jesus. He ascended into heaven, he sits at the right hand of the Father, God Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. Uh, that's what we have in our text from Matthew 25. At whose coming all men will rise again with their bodies and give an account of their own works. And they that have done good will go into life everlasting. They that have done evil into everlasting fire. This is the Catholic or universal faith. 
which except a man believe firmly and faithfully, he cannot be saved. Wow. One is not saved by what we do, we're saved by what God has done. And that's why even in this text, come ye blessed of my father. Well, that's very important. What is the empowerment for the people? It is a passive, not an active. Again, who's the one that's the real actor? It's God himself. It's God who welcomes people by his grace into heaven. It's God who sends his Holy Spirit to empower those that are now the body of Christ. But a good tree will bear good fruit, and a bad tree will bear bad fruit, if any fruit at all. And so uh, hey, works will be there to, uh, to be an indicator. Is Jesus really alive in the person, or is he not? But we rejoice that our Lord Jesus will come and will bring an end to the world as we know it and in perfect justice. Well, take those who put their faith and trust in him and bring them into heaven. And those that have been loveless and love the things of the world, love themselves, but not really people that love God and love the people of God, they will not enter into heaven. We thank God for his kindness. We thank God that what will prevail throughout all of eternity is the greatest quality of God, his love. To our God be glory and honor and praise. Amen. study of the scripture we alluded to the creeds and it seems appropriate that we might uh, make use of one of the great uh, ecumenical creeds. I won't deal with the Athanasian creed it's a bit too long at this point although you're welcome to look at it in uh, so many of the hymnals, almost all Lutheran hymnals has it and then uh, also you could find it on the internet. But we'll use the uh, well-known uh, Apostles' Creed, uh, part of Luther's catechism, interestingly enough. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven. 
and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, let us pray. While I am not inclined to take from Matthew 25 a uh, more uh, uh, social ministry approach, it is appropriate that uh, since we are to love our neighbor as ourselves, that we pray for people in need. And today, taking out of the uh, Lutheran Book of Prayer, a prayer for the poor and hungry. Almighty and gracious God, in our abundance, it is difficult for us to realize that many people are hungry. The earth that you have created can bring forth food for all. But because of selfishness, thoughtlessness, and other reasons, some lack daily bread. So often we have not concerned ourselves with the welfare of our neighbors. Forgive us for our sins of indifference, neglect, coldness, and lovelessness. Look in mercy on the poor and the hungry in their sufferings and supply their wants. Keep them from becoming discouraged, bitter, and resentful. Ever be their refuge in time of affliction and cause them to experience your infinite love and power. Help us to see the needs of the people on our street, in our community, and throughout the world. Kindle our hearts in our hearts a love that radiates sympathy, kindness, concern, and generosity to all mankind. We thank you for our many blessings. Help us to share them with the poor, hungry, and underprivileged. Above all, make us ready to share with them your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. And then we pray for prisoners. Dear loving Lord, who at the great judgment will commend the faithful, I was in prison and you came to me. Uh, we do please for all of those who are behind prison walls, um, those that are political prisoners and those that are sinners who uh, need to be made aware of your forgiving. Regardless of what they may have brought them to that place in life, we ask you to look upon them with your profound mercy and lead them to experience your infinite love. Help them to realize that they are not alone in their guilt for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Show them that because of your limitless grace, they are not too evil to come to you for forgiveness and help, not too evil to come to you for guidance and comfort or for strength and renewal. Keep them from bitterness or hatred toward their fellow men. Help them to begin a new life centered in you. And finally, cause us to do what we can to reclaim for the heavenly kingdom those who, according to men's standards, may have committed greater sins than we, but according to your standards, are just as precious as any of your children. In your mercy, please hear us. Amen. Hear the benediction of our Lord, the, the good word that God would have uh, people hear as they uh, go back into the world to uh, be about his business. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>